last year. Yeah, just to have something down the road. Um, and it's still a kind of a physical object, but it's a, it's a pun about obsolescence. Uh, I really think vinyl is going to outlast the CD. It's, a, it's one of those collector's items things. But um, <laughs> how much uh, information can be encoded on the surface of a plastic file? It depends on how small you write. This is true. <laughs> but, um, so Angola was Soviet Africa, and I spent about six weeks there looking at uh, a lot of the contemporary art and digital media scene going on, mainly from the viewpoint of uh, how an African culture could respond after a devastating resource uh, nationalist war. Um, so there's music from all over Africa, stuff from Angola, uh, Tunisia, Tanzania, Kenya, South Africa. The idea is electric Africa, um, and I really want... Uh, whatever, I was just at Google the other day, and uh, one of the few places on the planet that has almost no Google nodes is Africa. So it's actually the dark continent again on some levels. Uh, but I also wanted to figure out some ideas around mashups. So that's the other seed. So the pun here is we're looking at a social process, a network of exchange. And, um, you know, it's off you, it, there should be enough CDs for everybody, and if you didn't get one, there's, the, li the link is online anyway. Uh, so it's about, you know, kind of a pun of physical versus dematerialized. Uh, and we all trade, you know. So uh, with that said and done, what I want to do is jump into the books. Um, so in the audience, uh, do, you, do you think right now, you obviously uh, you've been in the middle of finishing up several really important and really interesting books. And I've always wondered, how do you uh, process your time? Because you, you're, you're traveling a lot, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm traveling a lot as well, but I just can't figure the way that you're able to continue writing and also doing all these lectures and all you know, it's, it's... Well, I, 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 I try to slice my tasks into things that I can do in kind of two or three minutes, and then I never let two or three minute gaps go by. I, I just I basically just, uh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's it. I, I, it's basically, you know, if you start collecting, uh, it's it's the it's like that scene with Richard Pryor at the beginning of the toy, where where he talks about how if you shave if you shave it, you, it may just be a billionth of a penny, but if you shave enough of them and stick them together, you end up with a lot of money. So if you shave those three minute segments, those two three minute segments, it turns into a lot of uh, time. So that's a, a tremendous amount of focus, and DJ culture is almost the opposite. It's too many people, too much time, everybody's just hanging out. But it's a good, it's, um, it's a nice paradox to balance the two. Um, I and think that's Superman 3, actually. Superman 3, I oh, think you're right. <laughs> thank you. Um, so the other question that I wanted to wrap up with is figure out a couple of things. One, the new book is um, written specifically for young adults. Uh -huh. Um, it's essentially it's about character taking control of the, the, the software environment around them, and it kind of... Are you into historical science fiction like Jules Verne, Edward Bellamy? Um, there's, there's a couple other novels that really, to me, foregrounded this one. One is Edward Bellamy's Looking Backwards, which is a really interesting science fiction book set in the near future of America, where everyone is essentially like living with credit cards, and he predicts a lot of really interesting things that are going on now. There's also a Soviet uh, science fiction writer named Yevgeny Zemnyayatin, who wrote a book called We. Mm -hmm. uh, and the main character begins to dream in irrational numbers. And uh, that creates a situation where it's a paradox in society and uh, he's being chased by these people and so on. But the totalitarian motif seems to really keep coming up, you know, in some of your work. I mean, do you feel in the next 10 years or so any of these are resonant with reality as we know it, or is science fiction kind of more of a prophecy, like Bruce Sterling, William Gibson in that tradition? Or? I think science fiction writers predict the present. Uh, even when they think they're predicting the future, I think they predict the present because you know you read you read, for example, um, Asimov and, and the things that he was anxious about in his fiction, and it was things that were that were happening in his contemporary time or Heinlein or, or any of the you know kind of the greats. They're all they're all sitting there writing about stuff that's happening right then as though it were happening in the future and making predictions about it. But I think they're really reflecting back their anxieties about the present. I think that um, we live at the unfortunate confluence. Of, uh, of, of two uh, technological problems. Um, the, the, the first one is a social technology, which, or, or maybe a psychological technology, which is uh, we figured out to uh, a really fine degree how to exploit the cognitive defect that human beings have in assessing risk, uh, especially ex assessing the risks of rare occurrences. So, you know, that, that we are really, really bad at calculating probability unless we have a pen and paper handy. Our intuition about probability is really bad. Uh, you know, the, the, the classic one is the Monty Hall 
uh, everyone, anyone not know the Monty Hall thing. So you know, but but it's all around us. You get off an airplane and you get off an airplane at McCarran Airport in Vegas, and you step out onto the Strip, and the rational statistical mind should look at those casinos and go, "There's no way they built these unless there was no way to win." 